uh, what, a, what a great morning we've had and great, great trial sites out there. Thanks to the staff and to the presenters are really presenting some great information. And I think if any of farmers would like some research work uh, ideas, could they please talk to the staff or there's numerous members of the board here. So please uh, share your information at, at a trial like that you might like BCG done as a members trial or, or as project work that BCG could see funded from numerous organisations. And I'd also like to thank the GRDC for the input that they put into to BCG. Um, the other short note about BCG is you well know that we are in a search for a new CEO. So that uh, process is, it will be coming, advertising will be ending soon. So anyone who knows anyone or anyone who would like to apply for a really exciting position with BCG as CEO, please see myself or a number of other board members that are here today. Um, Louisa, would you like to come up and talk about the door prize from Advanta Seeds? Thank you. So I hope everyone's got their raffle tickets that they got at the door. We are going to draw the lucky door prize. Colin from Advanta Seeds, would you like to come up? This is, this is to win some Nighthawk. Oops, without his glasses on. Ah, so we're gonna, we are going to keep drawing this until there's someone in the room who's got them. But it's red A32. Oh, there you go. Straight so, away, um, come up please. Would you like to say a few? Yeah, uh, just quickly, so the, the lucky door prize for us is a tonne of our new Nighthawk wheat. Um, and I think really lucky in lots of ways as a door prize in the sense that We've had a long association with Birchip and those early seeding trials out there really, Nighthawk's part of a new breed of wheats I suppose, which will be coming out in the coming years, which allow us to challenge the idea of in a system, where is seeding time for wheats? So Nighthawk is all about an April seeding option, uh, BCG and the likes of James Hunt have been doing that work for a while, so I suppose as part of this group's um, um, objectives is to really challenge these ideas. So let's challenge the idea of where wheat seeding time is and Nighthawk might be part of that. Thank you. The winner was Greg Ballinger from Hopeton. <laughs> thanks, thanks Lou. Um, we've got a busy afternoon so we'll try and, try and stick to it fairly closely. There's a lot of really great information going to come out. But our sp first speaker is Robert Brearley from ADM. ADM, as you know, are one of our principal sponsors of BCG. Uh, had a big background in pulse trading, in trading grains uh, around. In the early days, he worked with Josco. Some of the earlier members of BCG might be remember Josco, Andrew Joseph, who did a lot for us uh, in earlier days in trading. So, uh, very timely discussion here with a lot of pulses in the ground, and, and people are interested, especially what's happening in the in the chickpea and the lentil market. So, welcome. Thank you. A little bit shorter for me. Um, thank you again, and, and on behalf of ADM, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Um, we've only got about 10 minutes, so uh, a bit, little bit difficult to do justice to the to the topic of uh, the the international market. So we'll try and sort of zip through this fairly quickly and leave a little bit of time at the end if anyone's got any questions. I think um, just looking at it, I'll, I'll break it into two parts. First of all, the overall trends, if you like, in terms of what's happening with pulses, and then look a little bit specifically at the, the various lentils, um, faber beans, and perhaps Casper P markets here. I think, I think the good news is that um, the global trend is still very much uh, towards protein or towards plant-based protein um, in the diet. Not about the rest of you, but uh, certainly we at home, uh, at my place, we. We're eating a lot more plant-based protein, a lot more lentils in particular, uh, but also um, chickpeas and so forth as, uh, as well. So, um, yeah, that's not to say that I think uh, the market is still not uh, very heavily dependent on the Indian subcontinent, um, being India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, uh, in terms of demand, but also the Middle East, uh, particularly for faber beans and so forth, but also other pulses. Um, but, you know, I think we're starting to see growth uh, uh, around other places in the world. 
in particular, um, you know, North, North Asia and, and even Southeast Asia. China, I think, is a really good example where we're seeing good growth. Um, you know, probably 10 years ago, uh, China was using practically nothing in terms of uh, yellow peas. Uh, now they're consuming um, almost uh, a million tonnes and probably this year will uh, exceed a million tonnes of yellow peas, uh, which um, you know, I think is a good testament. And it's not just for human consumption. Um, it's for stock feed purposes, um, it's uh, for industrial purposes. There's a wide ranging use of, uh, uh, for, uh, for pulses generally. Um, I guess the, most people on the bad side, most people would be aware that, uh, uh, of the issues we've had with India in the last two or three years. Um, you know, let's be honest uh, about it, it's, it's protectionism of their own local markets um, and it's certainly caused some issues, it's certainly forced prices uh, lower in the last few years. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, India has, and probably into the future, will continue to be the make or break uh, in terms of um, you know, pulse demand. Um, they've had a few good years, uh, which has sort of helped, I guess, the government's uh, strategy um, in India, so they haven't needed to import, but I think you can rest assured uh, they're one poor monsoon away from needing to import again. Um, and that, that will obviously have a large impact on, uh, on markets. Um, I guess the other side of it is, uh, and then I'll call it a negative um, if it is, but uh, yeah, we are seeing uh, pulse production increase in a lot of different places. It's not just uh, the, you know, we're not just competing with the Canadas and uh, so forth anymore. Um, we're competing a lot with the Black Sea, and I guess that's something that we've been used to in certainly wheat and barley and other products in recent times, in the last 10 decade or more. Um, but we're actually seeing a substantial increase in production in places like the Ukraine and Russia, um, even in places uh, in North Africa like Ethiopia and Tanzania and these countries as well. And unfortunately for us, they're, they're, they're obviously very low cost um, uh, production areas. Um, and you know, very certainly hungry for US dollars, so they tend to be dumpers in the market uh, that we have to uh, contend with. As I say, I mean, we've been dealing with this, I think, for certainly the last decade, maybe the last two decades in, uh, in cereals, so um, it's just something we're going to have to get used to and, and uh, I guess, use our brains in terms of technology and so forth to uh, compete with that. Um, I guess uh, just quickly looking at uh, the more uh, specific commodities um, and starting uh, with lentils. Uh, global production sits at around about 3.8, 4 million tonnes last year. Uh, we're expecting that to, uh, uh, to be similar again this year. Um, there's been quite a, quite a deal of carryover stock, um, partly caused, of course, by the Indian... Um, um, I was going to say BAM, but it's not, but we'll call it uh, duties. Um, there's still product going into India, uh, but it's substantially lower than uh, where it was, you know, before uh, the Indian government's intervention. Um, yeah, Canada remains the, uh, the big producer, but there's more and more lentils being produced in, um, in the US as well, um, and of course uh, uh, here as well. In Australia here, um, yeah, uh, we're of the view that production will be probably about 10% higher than last year. Um, it, obviously, we're only in early September, so uh, it just depends how the crops finish. Um, you guys look, uh, look better uh, than South Australia at the moment. Um, on the surface, South Australia looks pretty good, but uh, they don't have the uh, subsoil moisture, particularly in the northern, in the mid-north and the far north uh, that you guys have got. Uh, so they're probably more dependent on the finish here in September, October. So that, that obviously could impact on things. Uh, there is a decent carryover stock, as most people would know. Uh, most people are sort of carrying a, a few hundred tonnes of lentils uh, around the place. And so uh, I guess uh, where prices go from here will be dependent on the next couple of months and, um, and, and what that brings. Um, I guess... In terms of uh, the outlook, in terms of price, um, you know, it will somewhat depend in the next few months, but the, uh, the Canadian or North American crop in general is in pretty good nick, um, and they're, they're uh, about to harvest. There's a little, few little murmurings about quality issues, but at the end of the day, I don't think that will have a major impact on the market. Um, the good news, I guess the good news from a price perspective is that 
um, historically, in US dollar terms, delivered to the destination markets, we're as cheap as we've probably been for a long, long time. Um, so, I mean, that I think that sort of indicates that demand will keep coming. I've been given the wind up. So, just quickly on favour beans. Um, yeah, we saw the market spike last year um, on the back of uh, uh, demand from uh, Egypt in particular. Um, I think it was a bit of a false summer in that they probably, you know, prices probably didn't need to go as high as what they did. At the end of the day, they've wound up with big stocks in Egypt and they're still um, busily uh, chewing through those, which is why we're not seeing the demand and which is why we've seen the price uh, peel back off here lately. Um, we're expecting about a 20% increase in, in uh, favour bean production here. Globally, it's probably up about the same. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think we're sort of back to where we are in terms of probably realistic prices going forward. I'll stop there um, and uh, be happy to take some questions if anyone has some. Are there any questions for Rob? Have we got a microphone? Prue. Well, very good, no Rob. <laughs> um, maybe if I could just say one thing to finish off. Uh, I'm fairly new to ADM. Um, I've only been there uh, for uh, about a month, but yeah, I've had 40 years uh, involvement in the industry with, uh, with other companies. And uh, I'm really pleased to be with ADM. I think it's a good time for someone like IDM to be developing in the market. Uh, you know, I think there's certainly a need for security payment, uh, which ADM delivers, being a very, very big uh, multinational company. Um, and uh, yeah, they're also very committed, I think, to uh, getting more involved in the pulse markets, uh, not just here, but globally as well. So uh, I'm looking forward to uh, meeting everyone a little bit more in the future. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Rob. On behalf of BCG, I'd like to expect a small appreciation, which is, uh, which is uh, a chickpea brownie mix, and he's going to go home and make them tonight, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We use up some more of those chickpeas, Excellent. so we're having a little lentil mix as well. Yeah, my wife makes these. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Morella Babadou from Caesar. Her role is using genetics, ecology, statistical models to better understand and manage agricultural pests namely aphids, of which uh, people are really quite interested in listening to with those, protecting those canola crops with the green peach aphid. Welcome. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to talk about the work that CSER does when it comes to insecticide resistance in green peach aphid. Perfect. So we call it GPA as an abbreviation. It originally comes from China, but now is distributed worldwide. And the problem with GPA is that in high number, you'll find damage from direct feeding. But in general, the main problem is that even in low numbers, it transmits about 100 different plant disease, including turnip yellows virus. So that's why managing it is quite important. And one of the specificities of GPA is that contrary to other aphids, it's polyphagous, meaning that the host plants that you can find it on is really wide. So that goes from cucurbitaceae, brassicaceae, so like the canola, but there's even a report that it could survive on poaceae, so that's grasses. GPA is the insect that has developed resistance to the highest number of insecticides, so worldwide that's 74. And one of the reasons that once it gets it, it spreads really fast is that they reproduce asexually. So they produce clones of themselves. So once a clone has it, it can rapidly invade um, a landscape. So what we did essentially is we repeated a national surveillance program for GPA that we did in 2012 and repeated that in 2017 and 18. So that really allowed us to have an idea of how resistant change in space, but also in time. So if we first look at pyrethroid, pyrethroid, sorry, we're seeing that the situation was somewhat similar four years later. We are finding that the majority of populations were resistant, but we're still finding some susceptible populations along that north-south um, divide in New South Wales down to Victoria. The same situation we found for carbamates, whereas um, there's more um, resistant population, but we're finding susceptible populations throughout. And we added some um, lands such as um, Tasmania and had more populations from South Australia that were also showing resistance. 
Where the picture did change quite a lot is when we come to organophosphate. So in 2012, the majority of populations that we sampled were susceptible. And when we went back in 2017, we couldn't find a single susceptible population anymore. And I'll talk more about how that could have happened. Something we didn't do in 2012 is look at neonics resistance because that just wasn't an issue in GPA. However, in between the two surveys, we had um, more and more reports about having problems um, using imidacloprid. So we started to include more and more population and end ended up um, screening all the populations that we've sampled. So that's about over 180. And we found that the majority of them were carrying resistance to neonics. That's quite worrisome. And even more recently, there was a control failure of GPA for sulfoxaflores, that's transform in WA. And when we did screen the populations, we found that four had some level of resistance. What I, we need to talk is exactly that about the level of resistance because not all resistance is equal. So it means that for some actives, the resistance is really high and for some other modes of action, the resistance is very low. So you can still manage it and you can still use that mode of action just very wisely. So to explain that, we need to understand the two types of um, resistance that we see. So that's target site and metabolic. The target site is the one we see for carbamate and pyrethroid. So what happens, normally an insecticide binds to the target and the biological function doesn't work, so the insect dies. When there's a target site resistance, it's just a change in the DNA alphabet that changes your target, so your insecticide doesn't bind as well, and then your biological function continues and your insect survives. So it's a very on-off resistance. It's sort of 100% or nothing. And the way we evaluate it and the way that we can, even without doing a genetic screening, have a pretty good idea that it's target site is if you look at the dose response. So dose response is the graph you're seeing here on the x-axis. Yep you're seeing essentially the pesticide at different doses, and on the Y is just how many of that populations were able to kill at that dose. And then we compare it to a population that we know is susceptible. And the way we put a value on resistance is with something called a resistant factor, which is just the difference between those two curves. So you have the difference between that resistant here and that susceptible. So when it's a target site resistance, you see a resistant factor of 1,000 and over. So it means it's really highly resistant. And what it means in practical term is that for you to go and apply the field rate, you're controlling not even 10 to 20% of that population anymore. So these modes of action, if you do have resistance, are essentially useless. And that's really in contrast to the other type of resistance, which is metabolic. Metabolic is what we're seeing for organophosphate and neonics. What happens is that every organism, including us, if there's a strange new chemical that we encounter, we have a way of detoxifying it. What GPA has done is that they've overexpressed these detoxifying enzymes, and they're just um, essentially destroying the insecticide before it even reaches the target it needs to do. Now, luckily, if with that type of resistance, we're seeing much lower resistance factor. So what that means is that you're seeing resistance factor, oh, resistance factors of 20 to 9. And if you look at the field rate with organophosphate, you're killing about 50% of your population that has resistance. So it's still somewhat usable. And when you look at neonics, um, your field rate still controls that population. So it hasn't reached a level where the resistance has evolved to be that high anymore. What I haven't showed is what about the sulfoxaflor population? How are they resistant? The short answer is we don't know. The first thing we thought is that in Europe, there's a target site that gives really high resistance to neonics and sulfoxaflor together. And we thought, could this be the reason? 
but when we look at the sulfoxiflor resistance, we did find the resistance factor are between five and 20. So that's really low. It's not the 70 or 1,000 that we're expecting if that was the case with this target site that has resistance factor of 1,140 and 70 for sulfoxiflor. When we screened the populations, we also didn't find that mutation in their genetics. But that got us pretty worried about if that mutation could be in Australia. So we wanted to see and test the different scenarios that that could happen, and there's two. It could either evolve within Australia or it could be an incursion. The way that it could evolve in Australia is to look at um, if there's a selection pressure, so essentially who's using the highest amount of neonics and in which region constantly over year. So there's some predictive modeling that was done using sales data and use data that shows that um, in Australia, the risk of evolution for any target site for neonics is essentially coming from those regions in pink. So, whoa. so that is New South Wales, Tasmania, a bit into Queensland, and then in WA. As um, looking at Victoria, we're doing pretty well at not putting so much selection pressures on those GPA. The incursion risk is coming from um, data that we collected from in insect interception at ports and airports, and looking when we do find GPA from products that are coming into Australia, where are their products coming from? So we realized that um, over 60% of the GPA that are intercepted at the Australian borders come from cut flowers. And these cut flowers, there's 37% of those that come from countries where we know that mutation is present. So really there is quite a risk. So what we did using that knowledge of looking around ports and airports, looking at those regions that are in pink, that have a high chance of developing that mutation. We deployed a system of about 300 traps and took all the GPAs that we found and screened them genetically to see is that mutation in Australia, yes or no. And we're very happy to say that it is not in Australia and that was over 181 traps that had GPA and we tested them all. So that's more than one, 181 individual because we just pooled all the traps together. So that's a really good sign, knowing that it is not in Australia and that we're so far doing a good job at not um, selecting for it and it's not coming into the country, but I think it's a warning that we need to stay vigilant. So what I've shown you is that out of the five groups that are registered to control GPA, we find some level of resistance to these five. Um, so it might seem dire, but essentially what we need to do is go back to that level of resistance. So if you think you have resistance to, um, for example, those OPs and pyrethroid, um, then you really want to test it out and make sure on a smaller plot of your field to see if that's the case or not. And as I said, sulfoxiflor, the levels are really low. They can still some be controlled if you rotate correctly. For neonics, um, the level is, again, still very low, so it's about just keeping an eye out on your um, crops that are emerging that have the treated seed to see if that's still um, effective or not. So we've boiled that down to four tips that we're trying to um, get across that would help to manage GPA. The first one is to control the green bridge, and that means both in uh, space and in time, and try to sow into standing stubble if that's possible. So the green bridge is a, is a question that not only if you have a constant green bridge with um, plants that is a host for GPA, that this is gonna be a reservoir um, throughout the year for GPA, but most worryingly for the virus. So it's gonna be transmitted to your crop more easily. Sowing into stubble is a question of visual cues so that the flying aphids um, don't suddenly detect a bright green cue for them to land on and attack your crop. So that's sort of disguising that you have your, your crop there. 
The second tip is making sure you identify which aphid. Now, you would think that something called green peach aphid would be always green, but that's not the case. It comes in yellow, orange, pink, different kinds of um, green, like the whole variety in hues. So it's not that simple to see which aphid is on there. So really, you have to get some microscopy equipment. That doesn't mean a huge microscope, but that does mean a pretty good lens to be able to look at those tiny characteristics about the tubercule that are turned inward and the specific shape of that siphuncule here. And really, you want to do that because if you have any of those other green guys, you might not manage the same way because all of these other aphids um, that can be find, found, sorry, on the same plant, they have no resistance to any of the modes of actions. So it could be much cheaper if you can confirm that it is not GPA at all. To help you do that, um, we suggest you have a look at the crop aphid guide from GRDC. Perfect. And um, we're also happy to identify anything that you're unsure if you have a good high-res picture or send us a sample and we'll ID it for you. The third tip is to assess that it's the right aphid like we just talked, but also what's your aphid volume or quantity you're finding, and if you're finding any beneficial at the same time. So ideally, the idea is that um, you'll find some aphid, but if you find enough beneficial activity, then you might not even need to spray. Or if you spray, you might want to choose an insecticide that is not so toxic to these beneficial. Now, that's not a, such an easy thing to decide. So we've put together this table, which essentially, essentially shows you in rows, you have insecticide, and in the columns, you have different groups of beneficial insect. And what you want to do is keep to those green ones at the top of the table, because these guys are not as toxic to beneficials. And specifically for GPA, you want to have a lookout for wasps and for lady bird beetle. And the fourth tip is something that is not just uh, specific to GPA and insecticide resistance. It's something that uh, Grant had a talk this morning when um, discussing fungicide resistance. It's just a question of rotating your modes of action, making sure you apply the full rate, making sure you follow the label in terms of nozzle and droplet size because GPA is going to be in the lower leaf, in the underside of the leaf, so it's really important that you have something that really penetrates your canopy. You find easily on the label uh, what group it is, and you can also subscribe to our pest fact and look at GRDC. They have a specific insecticide resistance management guide for GPA that gives you all of these. So four tips. Um, that should help you control GPA. And I just want to acknowledge the people that were involved in funding and collaborating for this huge effort. So that's GRDC, Hort Innovation, and Corteva. A lot of people at CSER doing different works in lab and with computers. We have collaborators in CSIRO and DPIRD, and Birchip for having us today so that we can talk about GPA. There is time for a quick question, if anyone has one. Our next speaker is uh, Ashley Fraser. Ashley's a grain grower and a process uh, from the northeast. He has recently been elected as the Grains Group President of VFF and Ashley is going to speak about improving the, the environment that grain farmers operate in. Welcome. Well, thanks very much um, for having me. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, and I must say, looking around the site today, it's a, it's a, it absolutely looks fantastic. And as someone who very familiar with uh, the work involved in these trial sites, um, it doesn't happen by accident. <clears throat> And I must say, it's an outstanding effort by all the committee and, and everyone that's worked on this site. It looks sensational. And uh, as mentioned, I, I'm based at Rutherglen over in the northeast. Um, so travelling across, 
most of the state is looking really good. And uh, I think I think here is probably one of the best I've seen. Um, obviously, there's some there's some poor patches in the northwest of the state, but across the, as far as a, you know the entire country goes, uh, Victoria is pretty well placed. Well. Um, BCG is very heavily involved in research, development and extension. There's another, there's another um, addition to that RDNE equation and that is advocacy. And advocacy is, is really about improving the environment with which we farm. And we do this by influencing policy direction and ensuring that infrastructure is fit for purpose, regulation is reflective of current practices and that Spring Street understands what we as farmers and grain growers need. Things, things that we've had um, recent wins on, we, uh, we campaigned very hard as a VFF to get a review into the local government rating system. Um, the current system's broken with farmers hit by disproportionate amounts and contributing the lion's share to local governments. It's, uh, it's something that we've campaigned very hard for and we've been successful in. And there are public forums going on around the state. They started three weeks ago. Um, the closest one to here that's coming up is the 15th, uh, Tuesday the 15th of October in Horsham. Um, and something as farmers we need to do is really be vocal and get out there and support those and, su and support the rest of your, your, your businesses and so forth and have your say. Recent wins as, as for VFF Grains, and we're very heavily involved in road regulation. Um, we have protected the Victorian access under the National Class 1 notice. So unlike New South Wales and Queensland, Victorian farmers don't require certified pilots and police sign-off on planned routes. Track tractors weren't classified, so up until recently, um, you, you actually weren't allowed to drive a track tractor on the road, so that we've had that overturned. We've also, a big one is, is amended the Vic Roads road design note, which protects access for agricultural machinery. Um, you mightn't realise that it, when Vic Roads um, and local governments and, and state governments were planning roads, they never had to give any consideration to agricultural machinery access or movements. And so they, now that has been replaced and they must consult with agriculture and, uh, and, and make sure that access isn't impeded. We've also had an extension to the, the road train network along the Calder Freeway down to Charlton, um, which improves that whole access for getting feed and hay through to the, through to the north. And, 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 and with that, there are still, we still have some um, problem, problematic areas with cross-border, getting across particularly the Tooley Buck and Swan Hill bridges, but um, there's, there's load access limits there. Things that we're st continuing to work on, um, Murray Basin Rail Plan, um, we, just, we just want good communication, give us some time frames, let's get the business case right. The Victorian government say that they're the only government that can deliver this project, let's see it. Telehandle licensing um, is another one. If your telehandler is over three tonnes, then it's not classified as a front-end loader, it is actually comes under a crane licence. This doesn't reflect how our farmers actually use a telehandler, and so we're working um, diligently behind the scenes to try and get that get some um, workable regulation and get the licensing appropriate for how we use it. Harmonisation of hay carting, again, particularly in these drier times, we've got, to get, we've got to be able to get that fodder to where it's needed. Heavy vehicle licensing, um, the, the mandatory gap between a tw of 12 months between HR licences and HC licences, it's not workable, it's not, it's not, in, it's not in keeping with current practices. Um, most farms now have a heavy combination truck and we need to have that licensing system as a competency based system, not just these mandatory 12 month limits. We continue to, to campaign around Melbourne port pricing and, 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 and access. What we, what we need there is, is to get the full size trains in there. At the moment you have to, you have to cut trains um, to get them into the port. Let's get, let's get full trains in there, get the access and make sure that those, the costs involved that do actually come off the imported goods rather than being slugged onto the suppliers and the farmers that supply into those, into those ports. We have a number of national issues and where you know, VFF Grains, we, we provide policy advice um, across many issues on behalf of all growers. And that, some of those issues are around chemicals and, and um, biosecurity, um, industry good and so forth. Payment security is the other thing um, that we've, we're very much, very much focused on. And you know, when you look at payment security, 
it's, we've lost $100 million out of, out of farmers' back pockets over the last seven years. And you know, I don't have to tell you that you know, once, you, once you decide on a price, you do expect to get paid for it. And uh, we, we, urge, we urge all farmers, ask for, if you're not sure of your buyers or whatever, ask for two-day payment terms. It, reduce your exposure, reduce your risk, and, uh, and hopefully we'll have a better industry out of it. That's a, a bit about what VFF Grains is up to. Thank you. Are there any questions about the current great work that the VFF are doing that are really affects all of our businesses? Thanks, Ashley, on behalf of BCG. Thanks very and much. Thanks very much for making the effort to come across. Cheers. The next presenter is Adrian Rolls. Adrian is no uh, stranger to BCG. He's just been doing some work with Ag Tired in Precision Ag. He's a farmer from Young, uh, and he's impressed with what he sees in Birchip this time once again. So, uh, welcome, welcome back, uh, Adrian. How are you going? Um, yeah, as John said, I'm Adrian Rolls. I farm up in Young, New South Wales. I've been messing around in this precision ag space for a while. Um, oops, sorry, got to stay here. Um, I'm also going to be doing some stuff with Cam Taylor in this ag tide space. So uh, I'll also get him up at some stage to present the last part of it. Cool. Let's kick on. So the ag tide stuff that we've been doing is all about uh, utilising the stuff that you guys have on farm already to actually do some precision ag stuff and do some management. So we're talking about basically you probably don't need to spend a lot more money to actually get started in this space. So this leads into my first questions, and unfortunately, I'm very sorry, we're going to have to have some interaction here. Um, don't look at me like that. But I'm going to ask you a series of questions. So my first one is, who here, just put your hand up, who here does precision ag on their farm? Right. Yeah, you can put your hands all the way up too, by the way. Who doesn't do precision ag on their farm? A few of you. Who thinks precision ag's a lot of hype and misnomer and doesn't work? Oh, no brave souls? Okay, don't, oh, thank you sir, down the back. Cool, and probably fair enough. So the thing is with precision ag, it's just another management tool you have on your farms. There's no dark art, there's no black magic. It's just another way that you can actually add a string to your bow to do some stuff. Also, too, precision ag will not make up for any bad management practices that you guys have. It still comes back to doing the basic wells, agronomics, timeliness, do all that stuff, and then this stuff comes into play. There's no reason why precision ag can't help you make decisions as you go along, but it is not the be-all to end-all that some people can make it out to. So my next question for you is, there's two ways of looking at precision ag. There's a site-specific way, uh, so in the paddock and all the rest of it, and it's also across your farm. So you guys out there, who treats every single paddock on their farm exactly the same? So who will treat paddocks differently? Why do you lie to me? You guys are doing precision ag. Okay, so you guys are effectively doing precision ag already. And one of the most important things in any precision ag toolkit is your actually own knowledge. Someone like me comes on farm and says to you, this is what your data says, and it doesn't look right to you, Go with your gut feeling. Cool? So when we start doing precision ag, this is effectively, and this is a famous quote, I don't know who did it, but it's like, I do, as a farmer, I do precision guesswork based on unreliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, a few nods heads, a few shakes of the heads, sorry. What we're trying to do with precision ag is this. We're trying to do precision guesswork based on slightly more reliable data provided by those of questionable knowledge. Okay, so that's what precision ag is. Everyone comfortable with that? Sweet. Okay, so let's talk about the potential of precision ag. You would see it out there in the press, lots of people like me trying to ram it down your throats. Well, that's because there's a lot of hype around this space. There's a report that was released and they said that precision ag worth to the Australian um, 
agricultural sector in raw data will be worth $24 billion. Value added data will be $50 billion by 2025 on 2014 levels. So that's a lot of cash. But the other thing with it is too, in the same year a report released by the CSIRO also said that it'd be worth $780 million and about $1.4 billion. I'm not very good at maths, but that seems to be a bit of a discrepancy. So the thing to keep in mind when you're looking at Precision Ag, the real potential for Precision Ag is actually on your farm. It's behind the farm gate. BCG did some work a couple of years ago where they put, it was worth about 70 bucks a hectare behind farm gate for you guys. So I don't know about you guys, but I would rather keep that on my own farm than let it go off. Making sense? Okay. All right. So probably for a lot of you guys, when you start thinking about what precision ag is, this is probably what you are used to seeing. Nice straight lines and the hardware that goes in it. And that is a relevant form of precision ag. But there's so much more with precision ag as well. Because the real value of precision ag is actual spatial record keeping. This is what's going to make your 70 bucks a hectare. It's recording what you did when and where and how your crops performed in a spatial sense across the paddock in the three dimensions. But guess how you actually achieve that? Because, I mean, you guys are probably just sitting here thinking, oh, well, I need to go and invest in all this stuff to do it. Well, guess what? Stuff you have in your tractor actually does it already. If you guys have GPS, if you guys have some spatial software management tools, such as like Back Paddock, Ag World, all those type of stuff that record all your spray wrecks and everything, and then you have some yield data to go with it, you are probably 80% of the way there to actually having most of the stuff you need to do precision ag. Cool? All right, so there's many types of data that we can get out of these devices. So once again, I can't emphasise this enough. The best data set you have is the one between your ears. Your knowledge is the key to actually making this stuff work. But there's yield, agronomic, machine, soil, heap and ride sensing stuff, public data sets, actually your financials for your farm. That's all relevant stuff you can actually use in a precision ag program. But we're going to focus on what I feel is most important data set for you grain growers, and it's the king of the data sets. It's yield data. The reason why yield data is the king of the data sets is it's the entrance and exit point of your precision ag program. It will tell you how much variation you have on your paddock and it will also validate what you do in your paddock was the right move. It might not be the data set you use to make a decision, but it is the data set that validates the decision, pro the decision you have made. So, since we're heading into harvest and you guys are actually going to have a harvest, unlike us poor broken down New South Welshman farmhands, um, you've got to calibrate. Because if you're going to use this data set to, for some information and validation on your farms, you've got to make sure that it is quality. The old adage of garbage in, garbage out really applies in this space. So, when we start talking about calibration, what do I mean? Well, this is the old method, and most yield monitors... Um, don't know. Whoops. Anyway, can't drive this thing basically show that if you only put one calibration point in, like a quick wizard calibration thing, you're only putting one point on the flow. And if you notice the mass of the actual yield sense, and if you want to learn more about how a yield model works, come to one of the Ag Tide workshops, actually shows that down the bottom, you're probably overestimating yield, and up the top you're over, um, overestimating yield, and there's only a small part where you're actually getting accurate yield on that curve. Whereas if you put in two points, we've now got parts where we're actually overestimating and underestimating yield. Whereas if we actually calibrate our yield monitor properly, and putting multi-point calibration, and here's another question for you, who calibrates their yield monitors? For those that, awesome, love you people. For those that don't, this is year zero. There's no reason you can't use the data set you have from yield to actually make decisions moving forward. But just start calibrating now. So this is the science behind it. But to actually make work sense out of it, you have to make sure that that yield data is being returned into a report card. So you still then have to put other data sets against it. And one of the greatest ones you can do is a profit map. And Cam's going to take us through that. Cam.
G'day guys. Um, so just giving some local context of um, some profit maps and how we're utilising those uh, to drive decisions, um, I guess. It, we've been running the Ag Tide workshops and this is probably delving into that a little bit more. So um, this was a paddock from last year, a wheat crop that um, went fully, uh, through to harvest. Um, you can see around the edge of that uh, we've cut that for hay, uh, just around the river there and up near the sheds, um, just to clean up some grasses along the edge of the crop there. Um, but inside of that, we've got a considerable amount of variation. Um, and we're utilising that to pretty much review what we've done and then, OK, if we get into the same situation again, what decisions do we make in that, in that um, paddock? So. We've got a range of yields there, so of of, um, of, of actually delving into uh, the profitability of that paddock right up to nearly a $1,600 return on um, a part of the paddock right down to a negative $357 return on some parts of the paddock. So the question that we're talking about at, a, at our farm table is, well, what, why are we doing what we're doing in that? part we we're actually losing money and if we laid our overheads on top of this you're probably looking at around about that $150 per hectare mark on top of that so I'd be I'd be considering all of that area into that now understandably poor year we need to get more yield map data into this and run that over multiple seasons to see what's really driving our year uh, our yield and our profit um, but this is obviously given us the emphasis to go and investigate that further. So, um, and what else can we do to either raise or cut costs in those areas of, of um, low, low return? Uh, this was a, another paddock, um, a barley paddock, and it, it, it's showcasing the same, same thing. Um, but yeah, what's driving the what's driving the yield, which is yeah, then transferring into profit, and can we can we do something? Can we reduce costs or increase our soil amelioration or something like that to to delve into that? So so the one key piece that we're missing out of this is probably our quality data. So a a protein meter on top of this would be fantastic to be able to delve into that a bit more to see if we can actually understand where where our um, where our profits actually coming from in the in that uh, paddock um, so when we when we go and add a protein meter on onto our headers which there are a few getting around now um, we can start to delve in into a, a into a, a really really good premium discount map gross margin map and the pro grain protein map where we can start to then really drive our nitrogen decisions over time if we're getting enough data based upon the season and i guess that's what we're going to just uh, touch on now and there's a there's a few of you in the crowd that have seen this so i apologize if going over the same thing but um we're running a case study at at uh, this year down in the Wimmera and the key point about this slide is is so specific for this year this situation and um, That will change next year. So we're always going to be adapting um, Not no one solution fits all but it's about the process um, So we've identified uh, Opportunity uh, I guess in this paddock where we had variable growth uh, in a bean crop last year, which we uh, ended up um, spraying out uh, last year in about August uh, and we went back in this year um, with uh, soil testing and uh, assessing the nitrogen and plant available water. We went into canola this year but we're using different layers to define those zones so you have to define your zone for a start I guess there's a few images up there. Um, the two on the left are uh, Google Earth images. Same type of camera, very different image. One shows up our soil type variation very well. One shows up an old channel being pushed in. Um, 
that's just about different times of the different times of the year and different stubble loads. So the the different cameras and what that can do, or the different time of year and what information that gives you is really interesting. And you can just use Google Earth on that and scroll through the time of the pictures, and that can give you some really good insights. Um, on the on the far right, that's a, a weed map that we've been running. Um, a few of you have seen that before, um, and in that particular year, the yield map right next to that, you can obviously see there's a two factors going in there. There's a soil type factor, but then there's definitely a weed factor that's driving that yield pr that that yield in that year. The middle, the middle there, um, that that was a frosted that was a frosted paddock in that in that year. So and that's driven by our soil type variation, which is very cl closely closely related to the to the uh, second from the left there with that Google image. So, so these are, we're, we're used, utilizing this, but it's got to come back to the farmer's knowledge. I can't, I go home and I go, oh, what happened here, Ian and Peter? Uh, they go, oh, it was just frost. Yeah, oh, okay. Can we do anything different about that next time? Oh, nah. Oh, I'm saying, well, actually, we lost money on that. Can we do di something differently? Why, why can't we do something differently? We've got the data there to tr drive a different decision. So that's about understanding the limitations of the layers. Um, one key thing that I, I believe most of the farmers here would actually, um, looking at your fuel efficiency map um, is a really key one that links in with um, your topsoil variability. Um, so your cedar is a really good stable uh, uh, data set if you're travelling at the same speed and you have little slope, those limitations, but it actually does give you a really good picture and that's the third from the, oh, the, the closest one to myself here. That's, a, that's a, actually a fuel efficiency map which matches up really, really nicely with our topsoil variation. Um, so we go from really black clays to red soil to um, a mixed clay in that paddock. Um, so that's the, that's the layer that I've used in this situation. We did some site-specific soil sampling, so came in and um, soil sampled on that. Uh, and we did a range of different tests, but in this one I was really focused on the water and nitrogen. So. After getting that data, what do I do with it? How do I come to a decision? Um, so, so what I've done here is use tools like Yield Profit, Yield Profit Lite, an Excel spreadsheet using simple tools like French and Schultz, um, Soil Water Express, old knowledge of my father and my uncle, uh, old trials, BCD trials, and simple things like Google. So. I needed to figure out my plant available water. So what I've done there is I've gained a uh, particle size analysis uh, test and plugged that into a free uh, free thing uh, on the internet called Soil Water Express. Um, so it just gives you a plant available water or your bucket that, that your um, soil, how much water your soil can hold. So this was one of those, those um, zones in that paddock, uh, which came out down to a metre, I can hold 89 millimetres of water. So that was, that was what I, what, what, the process that I followed to get my plant available water. I did combine that with my soil testing, and this is the starting piece that I got there. So the three zones there, I got a starting water, soil water, where the beans grew, the water was obviously the least amount on the red ground, uh, so 54 millimetres of starting water, and it had the most nitrogen. On the black ground, we had more water and a little amount of nitrogen where the beans didn't grow. Based upon the water, we uh, made a predicted um, yield uh, that we are basing that off uh, average season, so a decile five season. Um, and then we came up with a urea recommendation for that wow. zone. So that's, that's the process that we went through to, to doing that, to coming up with a decision, putting it into action. So how do we do that? We need to get the agronomics right first. So done the plan available water calculations, uh, done the soil testing, and we got a good crop germination on time. 
the economics, we didn't have a variable rate spreader at the start of the year. Bit of Googling, $500 later, we've got a variable rate spreader. So like what we're saying, you've got the gear there, it's just learning how the systems work and turning it into what you need to do. So um, we had considerable variability. And the other key thing is um, we calibrated our spreader how many people calibrate their gear before going and doing this type of stuff. Are you spreading 36 metres? Are you spreading 33 metres? You're just going to add variability on variability if you're not quite, if your machine's not set up right. So making sure your machine's set up right. This is what we ended up with. Um, so we use uh, Trimble Ag. Um, so that, that's the software that we use. Uh, we use the fuel efficiency map to come up with the zones, and then we just added in um, the test strips to validate this, the decisions. So the blue zone, we had um, the highest rate, the yellow zone was a medium rate, the green zone, the low rate. The red strips through that is a zero rate, and then we alternated the other test strips to know that, that we we're validating our decisions. Um, so I've been following the NDVI images. They haven't been showing up anything, which was really annoying. So I wanted to investigate that more. Um, actually went out in the paddock and it, all it's showing is a growth stage difference within different parts of the paddock based upon soil type um, driving that. And, and that was a really good take home that I was like, oh, well, actually NDVI is not going to the in, be all and all. It does tell you something, but not necessarily uh, correlated with biomass or yield. So that was just a key take home that I got there. Um, investigating a bit more imagery, so we get different different types of imagery, um, and I can start to see the test strips come up in there. If you can actually see the the test strip there, test strip there, and there, so we'll start to seeing. I was like, okay, now I'm seeing something. Let's do some more investigation. So pulled th pulled that data back onto the computer where we can manipulate the um, the, the scale a little bit more. And what we're finding is um, the zone over here, that's the zero strip, and that's the high, the, the high strip here. We're actually, the, in that zone, we're seeming to be nailing the, the rate. We're not getting much more of a response out of the high end strip. And we've got a good urea response from the zero strip. Here in this, in this zone, uh, we've definitely got a response of putting urea on but maybe we haven't got enough nitrogen on that strip and that's probably where we could have actually gone out and actually put a bit more nitrogen on if I had this data at an earlier growth stage. So, so we're going to um, take that through to yield and get, the, get the, um, the validation of our expenditure on those different zones and see if we've actually done the right thing or not. There, the other key thing with that $500 cable is it's actually done some, it's actually allowing us to do some spatial record keeping. So now every paddock's actually got a trial in it because they love to end the paddock with a box full of urea and then go back over the paddock again. So um, we're, what we're seeing is, um, oops, sorry. What we're, what we're finding is now we've got a perfect map that we can go and investigate at the end of the year. So this is where Adrian was touching on there that your spatial record keeping is key to knowing what's driving your profitability. If you weren't recording what you were doing in your paddock, then you're really going to struggle about analysing that data in the in the end. So really key that you're, that you're recording what you're doing and you know where you're doing it and you have to record that at the time or it's lost forever. So that's the... That's the that's one of the key things there. Um, so we've been running the Ag Tide workshops. Um, so we've done a first series of workshops that are engaged at a, at a fund building the fundamentals of PA. We're looking at uh, taking those groups, um, building on those groups, and actually delivering really what you want to be able to, uh, the pain points that you've got, so make sure you come and see Adrian, myself, or Philip Guthrie um, here at BCG, and we want to really work through your problems. Um, 
So that's Phil's number there. Make sure you give him a call. Um, we're really keen to yeah, delve into the, the gritty details of your pain points and, and really work through those. So, so um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, the Ag Tide workshops have been funded out of the Victorian government and, um, yeah, looking at moving this forward. Oh, sorry. Also, too, I collect vintage motorbikes, so if anyone has any sitting around in the back shed, feel free to come and talk to me. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any quick questions to Adrian before he sits down, or he'll be here for a little while, so please, uh, please catch up with both Cam and Adrian, you're doing a great uh, job. I, I can see a lot of people sitting on the edge of their seat, and I just wonder why. It's probably because there's Dale and Dale going to come up and just... Uh, Dale Gray and Dale Board, I'd like to welcome up uh, the, as a tag team effort. We're going to be looking at how much moisture is left in the soil. There is actually a probe that the department have put in the soil in the paddock here some years ago. And I think you'll be talking about that. And also, uh, Dale Gray, that we're, what is the outlook? What are the influencing factors for the rest of the season to get this crop over the line? So welcome, Dale and Dale. Change of pace. Here we go. Oh, no, it's going to swap. Boyd, it's you. No. <laughs> All right, yes. Um, good afternoon. Uh, today I'm going to give a, uh, a snapshot into the work I do with soil moisture monitoring. And um, it's, a, it's a concept that Chris Sianess actually proposed to me uh, going back 2011. And he said, uh, You know this technology. Uh, works in irrigation, um, find a way how we can get some meaningful information um, in dry land. And so, uh, yeah, there's the installations of the uh, AgVic soil moisture monitoring sites, the locations. Um, and there is a, uh, a monitoring point here, uh, which is great. And if you're yeah, uh, driving out tonight, you'll see it on the right-hand side uh, with the, um, the weather station equipment, the rain gauge, um, but yeah, all the action is happening um, underneath the soil surface, out in the canola crop. But essentially, to get this to work, it's, uh, we're just using a capacitance probe that's 80 centimetres long. Uh, there's eight, sen eight sensors there recording soil moisture um, every 10 centimetres. And I guess the, the critical thing to get, it, get this sort of technology to work is to have it in the ground, undisturbed for as long as possible. So now we've got uh, some pretty long data sets. And uh, probably in the past, um, yeah, it just didn't work when you had it in the crop and took it out and you just missed those opportunities of um, capturing what was happening out of the cropping season. Because certainly what we've... Um, uh, ...seen um, in summer is um, some pretty big accumulations of, of soil moisture totals. Now what I've got here is just the... Um, the deciles from, from summer. Um, Just go down. Yeah, yeah. That one? Yeah. Oh, okay, right Yep, yep, right yeah. So, um, summer deciles. Uh, decile 10, uh, localised around here, indicated by uh, Birchip and this black line here. 
and decile 8 to 9, just outside of that. So they're just the, uh, the rain, so rain zone levels uh, that we picked up very significant um, soil moisture changes. So decile 10, we picked up with the moisture probes, moisture down to 100 centimetres. Uh, decile 8 to 9, we're picking up moisture um, being deposited down uh, 50 to 80 centimetres. So that really just sort of set the scene of um, the moisture accumulation. And um, uh, I guess by, by being able to track the soil moisture changes um, as logged as they're found um, with this date sequence. So um, here's the December rain. So over 150 mil at this site here, running across here into the growing season. Um, the green zone is where there's plenty available water. Uh, the, the blue line is where there's an upper limit. So the soil couldn't physically hold as, as, as uh, any more water. And then um, uh, this, I guess this is the, the danger point here. This is where we've picked up historically in the past where the, the crop hasn't been able to pick up soil moisture from below those levels. So this black line here just represents, um, uh, it's in fact, uh, the total of the, the seven sensors, so from 30 centimetres down to 90 centimetres. And certainly, you know, after the December event, we had a full profile. We lost a little bit of water progressing through um, the, the, the dry summer. But here, here's the breaking rains in May. Although we didn't get a, a detection in, in a change in soil moisture, it actually allowed that crop to, to get started. And then yeah, the, the rain events that just progressed through that winter, winter period, we found, and this is the critical thing, is that we see this black line here go up. And that's an improvement in soil moisture. And that's, and that's really the connection of deep soil moisture with this, um, this season's moisture, which has been a, a great thing. Um, you know, following that, there's certainly been rain events that's just added to the soil moisture. Um, and probably where we've been tracking at the moment, um, August, the start of August was quite good, but with that dry, dry tail end and obviously the, the, the canola crop that's growing there, we started to deplete some of those soil moisture reserves where we start to see now um, this drop away. But when you look at uh, the percentages, and I like to put these soil moisture values in terms of a percentage, uh, where we've got um, wet and dry. Uh, this needle here at the, on the 5th of September, so last week, we're sitting at about 66% 60 full. Um, whereas yeah, where we were this time last year and the crop was, or the paddock was actually in fallow, was 25%. But that 66% aligns up pretty well with the yield profit data set that's been generated from this paddock as well. Um, and so when you look at, uh, yeah, um, plant available water, lower limit here, this is where the, we've got the water currently being positioned. When you do the quick calculations, that's about 60%. So we've got two, uh, two, 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 two tools that we can use to get an estimation of um, soil water, and they're, they're pretty much both saying uh, a similar story. So that's um, uh, the Birchip site. We've also been monitoring, obviously, a number of sites around the state, but the one at Brim is also showing some similar characteristics uh, on the basis of um, the December rain. So coming from a pretty low base from 2018, but dramatically improving with those summer storm events. And again, sort of progressing through the breaking rains and then following rains through, through the winter period. And I guess it's interesting to know that those breaking rains were very important, but we didn't get that infiltration until we progressed uh, later on into that uh, winter period. This is a wheat cro crop growing here. And um, what we're actually seeing is a, a much more uh, active uptake of those deep soil moisture reserves. And so that, that, that's the, uh, the, the summary. And then when you look at the individual sensors, you can start to pick up where the moisture is actually being detected from um, with those individual sensors. So, gee, it's been really active at 30 and 40 centimetres to the point where it's probably at that lower limit. And uh, now it's been taken out at 50, 60 and 70. So, probably where we're rating at that at the moment is about 60%. So pretty good, you know, around that um, uh, Wimmera area, but, you know, they've certainly got other areas across the state that uh, are certainly on that drier side. So with the uh, Oyun Speedo, uh, where we rated that currently, this is growing a, a crop of barley. You know, it's, it's less than 20%, but it's also got a much uh, more mature crop with a, a barley crop uh, finishing flowering and moving into grain fill. But just in terms of the moisture depletion in the last month, 
um, it's gone from from 50 percent down to down to 20. So it's uh, had an extraction of 30 percent with that uh, earlier growth stage, and also just um, limited rain up in that um, uh, Mallee area. Uh, and just the overall summary of um, how the soil moistures are, are positioned across the state. I think the, uh, the, descent of the, the August rainfall really does tell the story that um, we've got the, the areas that have had the um, below average decile for August. We started to see the moisture being depleted from those um, monitoring points and that's uh, significantly drier. That would just indicate that in, the last, in that reading in the past month, um, it's 10% drier. Whereas uh, anything certainly down um, in that southwest area, they're about the same, so they've been able to meet their plant water requirements. Um, there's a, probably a few anomalies there. Normanville hasn't had much change in the past month. That's got a crop of lentils there, so that's probably why uh, the moisture extraction um, has not had a great change. Um, uh, and um, what's the other one? Oh, Canoa Bridge as well. So that's in a crop of fellow. That's still why its uh, percentage is still so high. But all in all, um, I guess all I could uh, recommend you at this stage is um, to, do, to use all the tools available to get your estimate of, of soil moisture conditions. I certainly have got a, um, I'm a big fan of, of knocking in coring tubes uh, pretty simply with this sort of device here, um, using a lever and a chain to extract it out. Um, and, but one thing that I am knowing by uh, what I'm seeing is by doing these coring uh, tubes and e extracting the cores is that um, the deep soil moisture that was in place, the connection that we saw at the, uh, with the breaking rains and progressing through winter is that the, the root system there is, is pretty significant. So um, uh, there's just an example here. I'm certainly seeing um, plenty that are sort of in that 80 to 90 centimetre zone and uh, uh, in this image here it's um, down to a metre. I've done a core here earlier this morning and, and picked up rooting, rooting activity down to 70 centimetres. So um, that's uh, certainly one thing that I've, I've been observing and saw something similar in 2017 as well. And maybe just uh, yeah, where we might end up with in terms of soil moisture as we progress through the season and um, Dale, go, Dale Gray will go into that outlook. Um, we just sort of draw into the, the previous history. So um, over at Normville, 2017, uh, had a full profile um, uh, halfway through August. This is a, a crop of wheat that was growing. Uh, I've just highlighted that um, progressing through uh, this late August into September period with limited rain, coming from this full point, this is the moisture change to the point of extraction to where it's got that lower limit. And that was um, yeah, rated at about a duration of, of 48 days. So we do know that the crops with big biomass, um, high yield potentials, certainly do have the ability to extract large amounts of moisture um, in the absence of rain. So um, any timely rain yeah, from here on in will certainly assist with um, helping to assist uh, uh, meet those uh, yield potentials. Number two here. There we go. Beautifully. Um, so my seasonal update for spring. Um, just really showing here map of Australia. Really just interested in uh, this area just up in here. So it's just just showing. This is the decile for the growing season so far. Really just showing that most of southern Queensland, most of the grain gearing, growing areas of New South Wales are in decile one, uh, below us 10% for their growing season. You can see South Australia sort of decile two to three, even WA decile one, two and three. And it's really just Victoria is in fact a shining light. Um, it's the only place apart from Tasmania that actually has some wetter patches in it. Um, but clearly going forward in terms of particularly grain marketing is that 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 is clearly going to play a very similar story um, to what it did last year. 
So sea surface temperature anomaly chart um, showing the parts of the ocean that are warmer and cooler than normal. And um, I'm not even going to talk about the Pacific Ocean. We often do, but it's, it's pretty dull and boring this year. Um, all of what we're thinking about this year is, is about the Indian Ocean. So what we have here is, a, is an image of a classic Indian Ocean dipole in its positive phase. Um, cold water off the uh, islands of Sumatra and Java in Indonesia. Slightly warmer water off the coast of Africa. Uh, and this is really the sort of the, the El Nino type pattern in the Indian Ocean. Um, interestingly enough, we had one of these at exactly the same time last year. We've had a number of them in the last 15 years. So at the moment, the dipole mode index um, is 0.97. The threshold for an, of a, a positive IOD is 0.4. So it's, a, it's, it's quite a strong event there at the moment. And it's been sort of in play up there now in terms of those temperatures for probably the last sort of three months. This is having a very classic pattern in terms of the cloud that appearing uh, off Indonesia, and in terms of these brown patterns, this is where the lack of cloud is a lot less than normal, so that cold water off Indonesia is evolving a lot less moisture above it, and so there's a clear lack of cloud over most of Indonesia and out here into the ocean as well. Um, we have a, sort of an abundance of cloud sort of happening over here off Africa. So what you're really getting there is a reversal of the normal system where moisture might normally be feeding in towards Indonesia, is that things are reversed and are moving away from northwestern Australia and going towards Africa. What is interesting is that in previous years with positive Indian Ocean dipoles, we've often seen a lack of cloud visible in terms of a brown line coming from the northwest. The positive Indian Ocean dipole is the best known killer of northwest cloud band activity. Um, and it's so far as such, we don't see a measured amount of lack of cloud coming down from that northwest. So long may that kind of stay that way. Um, but for reasons we'll see soon, there's been things that have been very different this winter with this current positive IOD compared to some other ones uh, in the past. This is just a, uh, a map of the cloud direction changes compared to normal. The arrows show the direction of the wind and if there's colour there, it means it's been blowing stronger than normal. So I've just highlighted that area off Indonesia. Um, the wind has been blowing stronger from east to west, away from northwestern Australia. You know, it was this kind of thing that stirred up the ocean here initially and made it go cold. And it's this reversal of the trade winds essentially here blowing away from Indonesia, which is essentially blowing those moisture systems here uh, further away from us. There's a water bottle just there. Um, this is a, a map, I've shown this one in previous years, this shows how much water is in the atmosphere that could rain if you wrung all the moisture out of the atmosphere. Um, when you're in the fluorescent green colour, you're at the maximum. So that, not surprisingly, is all up in the tropics where the sun's along the equator and it's the warmer. But you really can see that to the north of Australia there at the moment, uh, let me tell you, there's not a lot of exciting moisture in the atmosphere up in those areas. It's very much... Um, something funny tapping there, but anyway. Um, <laughs> it's very much a lack of moisture there, particularly to our northwest and also to our north. Um, if you go around the corner there, uh, you can see that up there in the Coral Sea, up... Uh, that there, um, I mean, it's warmer up in the Coral Sea. There's plenty of moisture up in that area. So if you... You know, if you were lucky enough to jag something that could actually bring moisture down from sort of due north or to the northeast, um, which would be something like a cut off low with the right kind of direction, um, you know, it's not completely busted up there in the tropics, but certainly when we're looking for stuff coming from the northwest, um, things don't look real flash at all. So um, you may be saying that's not good news, Dale, but uh, things have been pretty good up until now, and that's absolutely the case. And so why has that been the story? Um, there's been two things at play there that have been favourable to, particularly to Victoria and also to Tasmania. The first of those is a phenomenon called the Southern Annular Mode, which is the measure of the frontal system spinning around Antarctica. Um, and for much of the last uh, two and a half, three months, it's spent a lot of its time in negativity, 
which has meant that the winds around Antarctica have been slower and they've been bringing the frontal systems closer to Victoria and particularly south of the divide. A lot of those have snuck across the divide. You know, that's why we've been getting showery weather, two, three, four, five mil here and there. It's adding up, but it's not exciting. It's fine in winter, but it simply won't cut the mustard in spring. That, that things will have to be much higher in delivery than that. Um, but this is why it's been wet in the south and why Unlike previous positive IODs where the big high pressure has sat over Victoria and it's been quite dry throughout winter, that has not been the case uh, in this year's event. The other thing that's been occurring, much like last year to some extent, um, is the positioning of the high pressures, uh, as indicated here, even at the moment, um, further north of the top of the Great Australian Bight, which is a further north than a normal winter position. And at this time of the year, once we get to spring, a normal position for the highs would be around Adelaide. So the, pr the pressure belt should be drifting southwards now. It's now in a classic winter position, which, if we were in winter, would be a great thing. That's why it's been like that for the last three months. Winter has been OK. Now that we get into spring, this now becomes a blocking pattern to the moisture coming from the tropics, because in spring you need the pressure patterns to move south to move that tropical moist air further down so that you can get a connection to it. Um, so we're kind of getting this extenuation of winter type conditions into spring, which if that continues to happen is simply not going to cut it either. The pressure has been higher over most of Australia as indicated by the red colours here. Um, we still have much higher than normal pressure at Darwin and up in the tropics, which is like pushing water uphill to get it here into Victoria. So we're not, you know, we haven't got a good plane of moisture transfer from the tropics down into Victoria. And in terms of the model predictions, um, well, they're seeing all those things that we, I've currently showed you there in terms of the current state. They are sadly running those things forward into the next uh, two to three months. So uh, my model analysis that came out uh, last week um, shows that around the corner there, at least in Victoria, nine of the 12 models I model predict that the next three months are likely to be drier. Um, and if you look just towards uh, northwestern Victoria, 10 of the 12 models are looking in that drier phase. Does that mean it's not going to rain again from now on? Well, I hope not. Um, however, in the past, forecasts like this sometimes have meant that it hasn't rained from now on. Um, but I think it's important to note that I'm using a word here like slightly drier, let's, let's just say drier. Um, when a model does that sort of prediction, it's, it's maybe done 100 runs of the model and maybe 50% of those model runs are coming out drier. And so therefore they talk about the probability that things are likely to be drier. At the moment the Bureau's own model, so this one here, uh, going forward for the next few months, there's probably about 8% of the model runs there that think it can be wet. So it doesn't mean it's an impossibility, but certainly if you're betting people, and I'm sure you all are, um, the probabilities for rainfall that looks really good in the next few months are not so good. I'm sure that's what you turned up here to hear. Um, not. Um, I won't talk too much about summer. We don't have much predictability going that far, except that we'd expect the positive IOD to have broken away by then. Um, nothing happening in the Pacific Ocean. Average to drier predictions probably um, going forward there and a, you know, a greater propensity perhaps for warmer temperatures over the summer. So in a nutshell, um, that Indian Ocean up there smells pretty bad at the moment. And it's only starting to smell bad now because we've been protected by those patterns occurring in the south from the pressure patterns and the southern annular mode that have been sort of giving us some love during winter. Um, that northwest moisture source at the moment is completely cactus. Um, so higher chances of drier temperature predictions all over the shop uh, and model skill at the time of the year, at this time of the year is, is at its uh, best. Very briefly, um, we have a new uh, website. Everyone stands up here and says that, I suppose. Um, it's uh, called the Local Climate Tool. Uh, you can go there and have a look at it. Um, you can dial up numerous locations in southeastern Australia and have a look um, how various 
climate drivers like the positive IOD have affected the rainfall at your uh, area. We can actually, uh, this is all the locations in southeastern Australia, who's the probability of their September, well this is August to October rainfall, how that changes um, when you have a positive IOD and you can see the chances of being in the bottom third of rainfall in those red ones really increases quite dramatically and it doesn't matter whether you're in Tasmania, the Air Peninsula or up at uh, Dubbo, the probabilities are about the same. If we look at individual ones, this is one of those sort of what we call a chocolate wheel, a tercile graph for birchip. 62% of the years that have been positive IOD have been in that bottom third. There's been a couple of years, however, that have actually been quite wet. And you can actually use this tool to go in and have a look at those years. Um, now we're just looking at the September, October rainfall in years of positive IOD. Uh, 1983, interestingly, was one of those really wet ones. Um, down here would be 1982, which is the worst on record. So nine mil from now on um, in 1982. Interestingly, the second worst one on record is last year um, with only 17 mil. Here's hoping we can beat that. It's not a very large uh, step to get across. 2015 was 20 mil, 2006 was 30. Um, if we probably got 30 mil from now on, I think we'd be going, you beauty, lock that in, Dale, I'll take that. Um, that'd be better than what we got last year. I've been saying for a number of years that the bomb is going to be bringing out some weekly forecasts that are different from their... Um, the weekly forecast that goes out to seven days is their weather forecast. What they've been working on is using their climate model to look at forecasts that go out to the second, third and fourth week of the month as well as the following uh, couple of months after that. And I'm excited to say that it's actually happened and it happened uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, and so to find it, you need to go to the Bureau's climate uh, forecast page. The easiest way to find that, I reckon, is down the very bottom of the Bureau's website. There's a little bit that says climate. And if you hit that, you go to the climate phase the quick page the quickest. Um, and then you'll get these one week uh, forecasts here. So this is one from a couple, three days ago. For, that's basically a weather forecast. But then you've got week two, week three, week four from now. Um, don't look at that. Yeah, no, that's nothing to see here. Uh, certainly no rainfall predicted, uh, which is, uh, well, there's higher probabilities that it doesn't look very flash at all. Um, so that's where the Bureau's drier forecast is coming from. Uh, and unfortunately, they're not alone in that forecast. So that's it from me there. Uh, I'm just going to pick up my uh, ukulele because that's the sort of thing I do. I've got to get the words and music here because I can't remember them either. Um, here's a little bit of a ditty that I um, wrote a couple of uh, weeks ago. And I think Boyd is going to come up and help me, is he? Yeah. Not much to his... Uh... Oh, we're from cropping land. We're grain producers, we're from cropping land. In any season we will try to drill it in. Get grain in the bin. The IOD can take a hike and make it rain in spring For we're from cropping land These chilly mornings make me think of cutting hay With a big thirsty crop We just want a drop For we're from cropping Send it down now For we're from cropping land That's uh, 101 of marketing. When you're giving bad news, John, you fluff it up with something that's a bit light and colourful and funny and uh, <laughs> off topic. <laughs> I'm sure after that presentation, and uh, there, there are some questions to both Dale and Dale. So, uh, Prue, are there questions out there? Do you believe the oceans are getting warmer? And in that case, does warmer pools of water create more moisture in the air? Uh, well, the, the ocean is certainly getting warmer all over the world, but particularly along the equator. Um, and as a result of that, by definition, that has to evaporate more moisture. Absolutely correct. Um, and if we look along the tropics of the world, they, se they have seen increases in rainfall in the last 20 years as a result of that. Um, 
The problem is, though, at this year, we haven't got a warmer than normal patch to the northwest of us. And if we did, um, we'd stand a chance of getting more moisture down, potentially. So um, I think the, the overarching driver of our climate is those high pressure patterns and what they do. And when they sit in the wrong spots, it doesn't matter how good the tropics are, we're in trouble. Um, but when you get the breaks in those, and particularly over summer, when the ocean is at its warmest in the tropics, that's when it's evaporating the most, we can jag massive rainfalls like we did last December because those oceans are warmer than normal and able to deliver moisture if you get the right triggers and things lining up to send it down. I will just, um, in some of the years where we did get rainfall with positive IODs in our Ninos, for example, 97, I think we had good August, September rain. Uh, that was quite about our Nino and a positive IOD. Where, where did, it, did the moisture source come from the Pacific, the Coral Sea, or where did those rain events originate from? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, and the problem is with a lot of those years, when I want to go back and have a look at what went on, the data isn't there to see because it was the satellite era perhaps wasn't good enough. We don't have very good sea surface temperature maps from back then to kind of see what the heck was going on. And sometimes the SST charts look like it shouldn't have rained. They look perhaps look quite similar to now and you go, well, how did it rain? And yet it did. Um, and so it's, it's, it's about moisture sources and it's about triggers. Um, if we can keep seeing rainfall triggers, we're, we're a chance of getting something perhaps to drag down from the Coral Sea, correct. Um, but it's really, you know, if the, if the triggers disappear, I actually don't think the triggers are going to disappear because we haven't seen that big high pressure sit right over the top of us like we have in previous times where it's already been dry for up until now. Everything goes underneath us, belts New Zealand. Uh, sorry, Phil. Um, and, um, and at the moment, because all that pattern is lifted further north, triggers are likely to be drifting through, but it's, that, it's the connection to the tropics that I'm not liking the look of. So this, every year is different, and this year is no different. <laughs> Dale, there's recently been in the press some unusual activity down in Antarctica where there's <laughs> been some warming influences that haven't happened since 2002, I think. Have you got any comment to make on that? Does that have any influence on our pattern here? So that uh, Dorothy Dixon from yeah. the member from uh, Jill Jill. Um, that's, uh, uh, so what, what John's talking about is this, you might have read about the press, the um, sudden, uh, sudden uh, stratospheric warming down in Antarctic. Big word. Um, what it's meant, though, is that an area of the atmosphere above where planes fly, so the upper atmosphere, has warmed by 40 degrees in the last two weeks, which is absolutely massive. And you'd go, my God, what, how, does, what's, how has that happened? Well, it's just some random weather has caused that to happen, but it's, it's quite an unusual event. You're right. It's only happened once um, in, uh, in September of 2002. Um, so hence when you're looking about, well, what, how, what does this mean to Victoria? If you look at years past, there's not a lot to go on. So the Bureau of Meteorology's model actually predicted this would happen three weeks before it happened, and it, and it has happened. Um, and you better believe that changing the temperature of Antarctica and the atmosphere by 40 degrees is likely to have an effect. That is a massive thing. Um, how it's going to have, have an effect is going to be interesting. What it's predicted to do is essentially maintain that negative southern annular mode pattern that we see where everything is drifted further northwards. So things perhaps a bit closer to Victoria, but the trouble is once we get to spring, it's not winter, once we get to spring, paradoxically, that negative southern annular mode pattern has a drying influence, but mainly in New South Wales and the eastern coast of New South Wales, perhaps eastern Victoria. But if you looked historically at how that effect has affected the Mallee, well, for every year it's been drier, there's been a wetter one and an average one as well. So I think for us here, it's not such a big deal. Um, if you're farming in the North South Island of New Zealand, uh, if you're farming in Patagonia, if you're farming in uh, Tasmania, you are likely to be wetter and colder. But that's the only people that are gonna benefit from that northward shift of things. The rest of us, probably business as usual. As I say, you know, triggers are going to be there, but it probably means that once again, that sort of tropical bit is likely to be uh, cut off from us. Short answer to a long question. Thanks. 
Yeah. Did it get through? You've got one more? Yeah. Um, the less cloudiness, would you expect more frosts or bigger frosts? Oh, thank you for that question too. Um, so, so historically in years of positive IOD, there has been a higher risk of frost. That is correct. Um, and that would normally be because of the lack of cloud, particularly over Victoria, but more about the predominance of those large high pressure systems sitting right over the top of us injecting cold southwesterly air in of the night, much like we're kind of experiencing out there at the moment, um, and then clear skies, still nights, and then, and then frost happening. So I think that's not the good news. That, that's certainly the bogey card in play at the moment that doesn't get us out of the woods. Um, and this year, being the nature of it is, is um, there's probably, a, you know, there's a greater risk of that. More great news. <laughs> yep, uh, Dale, uh, my confidence in the Bureau's forecast is pretty low after this year because they've consistently been promising it dry and yet, as you can see outside, we're sort of cruising. Now, I know statistically that can happen, but it doesn't give me confidence with their predictions going forward. So is there any reason that they've been so far off for the last six months? Um, it's, a fair, it's a fair comment. Um, I would say you're lucky enough to be where you are, though, because... You'd be saying that if you live in the Mildura, you'd be going there spot on the money here, and they've completely tailed us up. Uh, if you live in New South Wales, you'd go, this is right on the money. Um, and so I think what's interesting is we've had a positive IOD, and we've had one for quite some time. The model has clearly focused on that a lot and dried off a larger area than what we've seen the effect of those high pressure and frontal systems effects, which have kept us and the southern areas in the game but are probably not likely to from now on. Um, so I think, it's, I think it's interesting. Things do look good now, <laughs> but if you're a betting person, I wouldn't say they're going to stay that way for a long time. But Oh, well, we that, so that's a resolution issue. Um, and so there's been a lot of... I suppose the thing is there's been a lot of weather events that have caused those rainfall to get to be so good in the Wimmera and the Mallee. So there have been rain events. They've certainly been not linked to climate events, whereas the climate models are sort of looking at those overarching things rather than just jagging weather. Um, I think what's interesting is if you looked at the, the May predictions by most models in the world for June, July, August, it was a 50-50 split really between drier and average. I don't think anyone really thought drier was the most likely outcome through those months. The Bureau's model was one model that was drier. But, you know, there were many models around the world that didn't actually think that. Um, hence, the take-home message from your question, I think, is just don't look at one model, because them's be dragons. Boy, Boydy wants a question. <laughs> Boydie, how long until we run out? How many days have we gotten if we didn't get any rain? That's a great question. Well, yes, certainly the host of those uh, monitoring sites, they're referring back to 2017 um, when they were experiencing these sort of conditions of uh, a full profile, a pretty good biomass of, with their crops and the outlook uh, as it is. Um, and look, that normal sort of site, 50 days, the whole profile was depleted. If we're sitting at 60% now, um, are we looking at 25 days? Yeah, so obviously uh, rain events are going to uh, swing that uh, slightly differently, but if you wanted to yeah, have a, a number, yeah, there's a guess. Can the Tigers. <laughs> Thanks, Dale and Dale, and, and, and good luck to the to the cats and the tigers, but even more good luck to the bulls over the over the Sea Lake Tigers at the weekend, the grand final. So go the bulls. Um, uh, our final presentation will will be by uh, Teresa McBreath, John Kierkegaard, and Cameron Taylor, talking about profitability in canola. And a thank you, Teresa and John, from coming from CSIRO and giving the presentation. Thanks very much, everybody, and thanks for um, staying, staying on. Um, before I start, I'd like to thank uh, all the collaborators who are part of this project. They're, they're up there. 
JRDC for funding it. It's five, it was a five-year project, so quite a lot of um, quite a lot of data. And in this area, it was Birdship Cropping Group who we who we uh, collaborated with. Um, and so thank you to them for running such excellent trials. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction um, about some of the science that, that went into the project and then uh, Cam and Therese are going to talk more about the, the practical uh, decision making that can follow from that. So really the, the, the overall objective of the project was to start to understand the canola plant and its physiology and what was driving uh, the reason you see it doing different things in different seasons, maybe flowering at different times, varieties sort of swapping their flowering time, like what's behind that. Um, and then once we understand flowering time, uh, how can we build biomass in the cheapest and most cost effective way to hit our yield target? So that all depends on crop physiology and so we really wanted to look under the bonnet of the canola plant to work out what was making it tick. Uh, the project was really driven by the GRDC's view that people understand the benefits of canola but find it risky, uh, high input costs and so forth. And so we're trying to take some of the risk out of it and, and make some decisions that minimise the risk around growing it. Um, as I said, in, in uh, the, the project ran from sort of southern Queensland all the way around to the Air Peninsula, so we had trials in, at all those sites you see there, and in this area, uh, BCG were managing the trials. Um, Two of the sites that uh, I'll show you some data from Gatton and Canberra, where CSRO had involvement. Basically, Gatton and Canberra pretty much bookend the climatic conditions that canola is ever going to experience in Australia uh, in terms of its response to, to temperature. Uh, and with lights to extend the day length at both of those sites, with facilities to sort of extend the day length, we pretty much can capture all that canola is likely to experience in Australia. And our colleagues have been sort of following canola, leaf appearance rates, initiation of flowering, flowering, etc., and linking it to the climate so we can predict how it's going to behave. Um, we had sort of three strategies. GRDC wanted a three to one return on investment, and we decided to focus on three things um, getting our earlier sowing systems right, getting the right variety sown at the right time, um, understanding how to manage risk and sort of input costs in the lower rainfall zone. And further north, we had a bit of work on harvest management um, uh, as well, windrow timing and, and su such. So this picture is really just to encapsulate a, water, a lot of work. Uh, I could show a lot of slides about you know, how canola responds, but I think it, this sort of says it all. You can see some of the guys, Jeremy Wish and, and others there, going out and watching canola grow uh, very, in a very detailed way and relating that to the climate, uh, particularly temperature and day length. The three pictures on the right hand side are actually canola crops sown on exactly the same day, the same canola varieties sown on the same day in three different places and photographed on the same day. In Ottawa in Canada, uh, in Gatton, Queensland and in Canberra. You know, where would you rather live? Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> And really just to show you that the, the only difference in those places is, of course, the climate. It's the same genetics. And so to understand you know, why that difference um, was really what we needed, we needed to do. And it really comes back to basically temperature. Um, canola's developing in relation to thermal time. Uh, and then the experience of cold weather also affects flowering time as well. So just the differences in temperature uh, be it cold or just the thermal time, sort of is what drives the canola varieties to do different things at different times. And we've got all that understanding now. We didn't have it before. We can predict when canola varieties sown at different times will we'll, uh, we'll reach different growth stages. Um, one of the other physiological bits that we needed to know was when is canola most sensitive to a stress? Um, we knew this for legumes and for wheat, basically the well, cereals. So the cereals are most sensitive to a stress about 20 days before flowering. And the grain legumes are most sensitive to a stress 20 days after flowering. OK, so this graph just shows you know, um, stressed canola, just stressed for a short period of time at different times. And you can see how there's a particular time in the growth stage when any stress will really knock yield around. At other times, the crop can recover. We had no idea uh, when canola's critical period was. 
Um, we do now. We ran a series of experiments. We stressed it 15 times during the season to find out which, which point in time is it most uh, sensitive to stress. And you can see here that, that uh, this point in time here, which is about 300 degree days after the start of flowering, the start of flowering being when half the plants have one open flower, so pretty early on, about 300 degree days after that. If we stressed the crop then, uh, we got a 40, 40 to 50% reduction in yield. Stressing it at other times, it had a capacity to recover. And I think that's the point in time when a canola crop has the most sensitive bits on the crop. So sensitive bits are sort of flower, flower buds and small pods. So a bad stress then will, will make some of them abort, and the ones that don't abort uh, never have the capacity to grow as big with as many seeds or with as large a seed. So you're sort of cutting one arm off and tying the other one behind the crop's back when you get a bad stress at that point. So once we know when canola is going to flower, when its sensitive period is, we can use a model like APSIM to predict the optimum time to have the crop flower. So the optimum time to have a crop flower is not when there's an absence of stress, it's when the combined effect of all the stresses is at its minimum. So frost early, heat and water stress late, where's the point in time uh, where you want your crop flowering to minimise the risk of the combined stresses? And that's what we've identified for uh, a whole uh, 76 places around Australia, in including Birdship. And so now we can advise when we would like the canola to flower to optimise yield, you know, based on average weather conditions. So knowing when canola, you want it to flower is great, but what you guys need to know is, you know, when, when should I sow a particular variety to have it flower then? That's the, that's the useful piece of information for you. Uh, and using a model like APSIM, again, we can predict based on the weather when you'd want something emerging in order to have it flower at that time. And um, we have compiled all of this uh, information with all of the current varieties uh, into a, a 10 tips for early sowing. There's a, there's a guide there. Anybody who didn't get the book this morning, there's copies of it as you go out the door. Um, and we've taken that one step further to try and develop an interactive app. So um, this is active. Um, when you get a chance later on, I'd encourage you to have a look at it. The, the website is there, www.canolaflowering.com. Um, hold, hold your phone landscape while you're looking at it. And um, it will bring up a couple of questions about either which variety should you sow because you know your sowing date, or uh, you've got a variety and, and or you've um, or you've got a variety and you want to know when when should I sow it. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I probably should have spit, picked stingray for this because it seems like that's a very common variety. But I picked bonito anyway. And if you go onto the app and you answer the questions and you put bonito in, it suggests that for birdship. The, the optimum sowing date for Benito is the 5th of April. Okay, so on the app, the blue line is the optimum flowering period, and this yellow blob will move around. If you change the sowing date, it'll move around, and so it'll line up all the varieties that are, that are available um, and show their sowing date, and, and, and what you're trying to do is get the yellow blob into that blue blob, which means that variety sown then is... Uh, uh, going to most often hit the optimum flowering period. And from what I saw today, it looks like, and from what Cam told me, that seems to be, it seems to be pretty, pretty right for, for that variety here. So what it's saying is for Benito, um, basically all these sowing dates are probably too early. All of these sowing dates are too late. But any of these are sort of going to put you close to that flowering window. So you'll notice it's not a day. It's not even a week. You've got a bit of flexibility there because seasons, seasons are different. But on average, that's the best place to be. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, hand over to Cam or... No, Trey, sorry. So basically, getting the flowering date is the, is the first thing you've got to get right. And of course, then the question is, um, what's the most cost-effective way to grow the biomass to hit that flowering date and yield potential with the minimum cost? And I think Therese and Cam will take you through that.
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my job in this project was to coordinate the low rainfall sites. So um, working with Andrew Ware and Michael Moody um, to cover uh, the Vic Mallee right through to Western Air Peninsula um, at Minipa. Uh, and we also worked a lot with a, a consultant, Ed Hunt, um, who uh, we spent a lot of time developing profit risk uh, case study farms uh, on. So when we're contemplating low rainfall, obviously it's all about risk when it comes to canola. So some of the management levers that we looked at uh, included time of sowing and the decision around sowing, uh, which cultivar we might use, uh, where we might place it in the sequence, and then once we've made those commitments, uh, what our nitrogen inputs might be. So the first decision um, that we have to make is whether or not to sow. Um, so this data is um, from Minipa. It's quite early um, data that came pr just prior to this project, um, but it's been reinforced throughout this project. But basically there is quite a narrow window um, for our sites in the lower rainfall environment uh, that essentially um, led us to develop a rule of thumb that uh, in the low rainfall environment, we mean need to be sowing before the second week of May. Uh, in order to um, avoid those uh, yield penalties with later sowing. And that partly comes from a lack of uh, choice in variety. We, we're dealing with um, early maturity type varieties. The second rule that we put a lot of emphasis around is how much rain you need to establish a crop. Um, because um, uh, in low rainfall, it, making sure you have a genuine establishment of the crop is, is really critical. Uh, we were mostly dealing with lighter soils, so in the loamy soils that, that value is somewhere around 15 mils within this sowing window, and for the sandy soils it's 10 mils, um, but obviously the stored water is also going to have a, a massive effect as well. Uh, and that's something that's um, sort of a flow on uh, body of work that we're undertaking at the moment across the project. And just to give an example from our own trial, so using this rule around not sowing before the second week of May, um, I mean, so we sowed before the second week of May, um, but whether or not we were actually able to genuinely establish a crop, you'll see that all of our sites, we had years where we had misses. Um, so Minipa, uh, which is a heavier soil, had a miss in terms of establishment in two years out of the four, and the lighter soil types had um, one out of the four where we couldn't establish a canola crop in the appropriate window. And we know that the growers that we're working with are, are having that same experience. So. Um, committing to growing canola uh, really needs to be around having a genuine opportunity to establish. When we started this um, work, we, we, had, we were pretty limited in terms of choices for varieties, well we still are, um, but basically when we contrasted the OP with the hybrid initially, um, we weren't um, getting substantial effects or benefits out of the hybrid um, and it certainly wasn't paying for itself, um, but last year um, we did um, in quite a dry year at Karinda, we did capture a 25% yield advantage using the hybrid 43Y92. Um, and the reason we picked up 43Y92 is because of observations from tri other trials in other environments across the project. Um, so, you know, variety choice uh, may, may be moving even for the low rainfall environments. Um, so once we've made that commitment to sow, we know that canola is a hungry crop. So one way we could contemplate managing the risk is to try and use a legume residue um, to, to use some of the nitrogen benefit out of that legume residue um, and to feed the canola. Obviously what that doesn't factor in is the erosion cr uh, risk when you're trying to produce uh, canola on the back of a legume. Um, but here's a really neat example from Oyen. Um, where Michael Moody had different types of residues, which had um, legume residues using um, field pea vetch um, mixes, um, some of which were brown manured. And the result of uh, using that range of legumes was that he had different inputs of nitrogen into the system. And so across that range of um, inputs of nitrogen, he could get a direct yield benefit. So the line is basically showing uh, as the nitrogen benefit from the legume increased, so too did the yield of the subsequent canola. So there is a, a really genuine effect of um, uh, having the legume in the system. But when we um, looked at these uh, legume benefits at Karunda, we also added nitrogen fertiliser to the system. And what we found was that we needed both 
um, that legume residue and the fertiliser um, to absolutely um, capture all of the potential yield benefit. So I guess that could be a bit of a surprise to some of the lower rainfall growers that they're still needing to feed their canola even when they're on a legume residue. And when it came to the question around uh, feeding with nitrogen, um, we did consider timing as a factor, thinking that if there was the opportunity to delay the timing of nitrogen input, that might help us out in terms of managing the risk. Um, this uh, analysis is actually a combination of wheat and canola uh, crops grown across those uh, seasons that the project was running. And what we see was the, a little upshot here. So this is the very wet spring of 2016. This is our canola crops. We're delaying the inputs of nitrogen to bolting uh, with a wet spring did have a significant percent yield benefit. Um, but there was also a downside. So in the drier growing seasons, delaying inputs of nitrogen uh, had a penalty and often the yields were sitting along the line. So really timing isn't the most critical factor in low rainfall environments and often logistically our low rainfall growers are saying um, getting it out earlier is, is really their um, preference. The other factor to consider is actually having the rainfall event that's going to incorporate that nitrogen and what we see uh, at our low rainfall sites, um, I should have put birch in because we've actually done that graph, is that there are a relatively low proportion of um, relatively low chance of uh, having a 10 mil rain event in each of those weeks of winter. Um, so they all sort of sit below 40% chance of having a rainfall event that'll incorporate um, urea when it's top dressed. So um, the other thing I wanted to, to quickly mention was, um, I, met, I told you about the hybrid yield advantage um, at Karunda last year. Um, and at Karunda we tried to produce a full uh, yield response to nitrogen um, to really round out our understanding of what the best nitrogen dose might, might be. But unfortunately we picked a decile one uh, year to do that. Um, but the thing that really intrigued me was both the yield benefit of the hybrid um, and its nitrogen efficiency. And what we actually found was that the hybrid variety was more efficient in its use of nitrogen fertiliser. Um, which could be a, a, a real advantage around the risk in, in that comes with uh, having to uh, purchase that seed. But there, it's not limitless. We did have some, some capping off of yields in the stingray um, at the very high doses of nitrogen at more than 120 kilos of N. So essentially our messaging around low rainfall agronomy is that we need an establishment opportunity within that optimal start of flowering window and we need between 10 and 15 mils of rainfall um, before the second week of May um, to make that happen. Still, our hybrid options are limiting, limited, um, but 43Y92 is emerging, uh, and there is a high demand for nitrogen in that system. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was some of the profit risk analysis that we've done um, in this space. So. Uh, with Ed and advisors and growers in each of the locations, we've developed case study farms uh, where we consider some of the, the farm level effects of these decisions. So they are to sow or not to sow, uh, what variety to use, where to place it in the sequence and, and how much to feed. So in terms of to sow or not to sow, um, we had a look at the percent of years that have establishment opportunities in the different windows. Um, and you can see that they drop off quite rapidly uh, from that second week of May, which is what I uh, was talking about before. Um, so using those sowing windows, we then imposed um, some yield penalties um, to work out um, what kind of uh, yields we would expect with different sowing um, strategies. So here we see on the heavier soils, um, or where there are more heavier soils in the upper EP, um, that there is a bigger gross margin benefit when you opportunity sow. So when you apply those strict rules around only sowing with a genuine establishment opportunity, uh, the benefit to the sequence gross margin is greater um, than it is when you have a predominance of lighter soils. And I'm presenting that outcome over the full range of, of deciles, and these are the um, deciles according to rainfall. The second decision uh, to contemplate is what seed to use. Um, and to answer this question, um, we just 
thought about what kind of yield benefit, persistent yield benefit you would need from using that hybrid seed compared to a, an OP uh, variety. And here I've contrasted it um, in a, a pretty extreme way just to, to sort of think about when people extrapolate messaging. So on the right hand side I have the lower EP, one of the most intense canola produ production areas that we have, and I've contrasted that with the Mallee farm. And what you see, um, particularly around the Decile 5, is, is you need a persistent yield benefit of more than 20% uh, in the Mallee environment um, to justify the use of the hybrid. The other thing that does is reinforce um, you know, the need to, to further improve our OP varieties um, uh, for low rainfall environments. The things that we haven't accounted for there um, are, you know, when you, um, if you take the, if you buy hybrid seed and then you don't sow it, what the costs are associated with keeping that on farm. That sort of takes a, a bit more in-depth analysis. The next thing we looked at was um, what the, se um, the benefits of canola look like in the sequence. So here we're contrasting um, the gross margin uh, when we grow wheat on legume and compare it with canola on legume. And you do see that there's a bit of a downside, so there is more risk, obviously, with growing canola in lower rainfall seasons, um, but there's also an upside, and it's pretty substantial. It's more than $100 per hectare. But as Cam mentioned earlier today, there's also variation around that that, that we have to consider. Uh, and when we look at the full sequence gross margin, um, the advantage from, from including um, canola in the sequence in um, a flexible way uh, ranges from around $17 to $56 um, dollars per hectare. So in that example, we've always included uh, canola over a five-year run, uh, but we've done it in the opportunistic way. The last thing I wanted to touch on was the effect of nitrogen management. And here I've just made a really simple comparison. Um, so a lot of the guys we were working with were just using 30 kilos of nitrogen across the board for all of their soil types. Um, and then based on the responses we've generated in our trials, we've come up with a simple set of rules uh, for nitrogen input. So, under, so knowing we can't perfectly predict the seasons, uh, but we do know a little bit about whether or not we're going to establish a decent crop. Um, so the rates all lift at a decile three, um, but we also know that our heavier soils are less responsive to inputs of nitrogen, so they max out at 50 kilos of N, while in the wetter seasons our sands receive up to 80 kilos of N. And when we look at that as a gross margin, um, we see that there's some, some pretty substantial benefits, um, particularly in the higher rainfall seasons, um, with only the downside um, in low rainfall seasons against the 30 units of N without that reactivity. So that's all I wanted to cover on low rainfall. G'day again. Um, so yeah, I'll just uh, talk on the BCG key findings that we've had locally um, around here and at Long Renong. So, um, so this was just a snippet out of the, um, the booklet, so um, uh, about the flowering dates. But the first key finding, I guess, that we had was the fast to mid-fast developing varieties are best suited to the Wimmera and Mallee environments. And if we can take that as your take-home message today, I think that was, that's a really good message for us to take home. Um, Oyen the 11th of July, Birchip the 26th of July, and Horsham the 6th of August. Um, and there's a range around that as well, but they're, they're three key dates to, to keep in mind. Um, the only variety out here this year to hit the 26th of August was um, Diamond, which germinated on about the 7th of May. So only one variety, the fastest variety that we have available to us, hit the 26th of August. And I guess that's a pretty key message as well. Um, Hybrid varieties have a higher end use efficiency than OPTT varieties, so the currently available ones, I should say. So it's backing up what Therese has been finding uh, up north as well, so we've been finding that down south. So that's it, good that that's comparable ac across environments. So I'll go into that a little bit. Um, so the four-year summary. 
2015, one of the worst years I've seen in the Wimmera. Uh, we were following a wheat um, in that year, uh, and yeah, it was a it was a pretty much a decile one, um, and we uh, only averaged 1.2 tonnes to the hectare that year across that trial. It was a shocking year. Um, 16, one of the best years. Uh, we followed favour beans and the yield of that trial was 3.46. We had a fair bit of disease come into the trials that year. Um, probably might have capped the yield potential there. In a, that, so this is average of all varieties in that trial. Following lentils in 2017, a really mild finish to the year. We actually, our average um, went up to 3.83. And in 2018, um, we uh, had an average of 0.75. So quite a, bit, uh, quite a dry year last year as well. Um, so, so we got a good range of environments across those four years. I guess that's what the key message there is. We actually put these different varieties, different maturities in different situations uh, across those four years. So this was at the start of the year I pulled this out. So that was the uh, recommending sowing guide in our books and, that, and that's based off historic and what farmers are doing and the research that was available at that time. Um, I guess one of the key messages of, our, of, of what we've been doing is realistically this has moved three weeks earlier. Um, that, that's probably one of the key messages. So uh, what, what we've really found um, with, the, with the varieties, and if I go, uh, we're talking about the Mallee, um, April through the second week of May, that might be all right, but we definitely need to be pushing into more into April now to get that optimal flowering. In the Wimmera, what we're finding is, yeah, that, that really needs to push three weeks earlier. So to hit those optimal flowering dates. So I just compiled all the data that we've been collecting over the, the last, um, the last four years, five years now, actually, including this year. And um, these were the range of varieties that we had in the trials, but the, the main thing is to look at the phenology. So fast varieties, we can sow those to the end of May, pretty much. Um, Diamond at the end of May was still hitting the optimal uh, flowering window. Um, something like a 44Y90, which has got a really good fit for our environment, actually has a sowing window that actually allows you to sow at the start of April right through to the first week of May. And that's why that's such a widely adopted variety. And up here where we've got Stingray, it's actually fitting right into that window. And the if we're sowing anything later than the Stingray, we're actually falling outside of that window. And I think that's what's been driving our, our yield potential of our canola and our so variety selections over time here in this region. Um, we talk about the opportunistic timings of, of, of these types of varieties. So our mids to mid slows. So we actually, our mids, we can actually push them nearly into the, the last week of um, March in this environment, and that's actually hitting our optimal flowering window or the start of the optimal flowering window. So, so, and then we get to a slow variety like Archer, and we shouldn't be sowing that any, any later than the first week of April in our environment. So that, that, that's probably a, a key message there. So um, that, that's probably one of the, the biggest learnings, and I'll touch on that a little bit as we go through. Talk about yield potential at the early in the season. So um, we we had a really big emphasis on trying to hit the optimal yield potential in these in these um, years. So to have to hit the optimal yield potential, you actually need to achieve around about if I get this right, this point here, which is about four tonnes of biomass at the start of flowering. Now, it's not to say that you'll get your, get your optimal yield, but that's what you need to achieve to be able to hit your optimal yield potential. So, so that's all the data points from across those four years. And you, and you see 
actually achieving more biomass than four tonnes actually wasn't wasn't allowing us to get up above that. So so that was just a, a good little finding there. When we delve into the data, what does that mean? Actually, so we've got a, a good maturity effect here. So our later season varieties, no matter whether that's high or low end, actually are getting to that four ton to the hectare of, uh, of um, biomass being produced. But this is only at the start of flowering. So you've actually got a long way to go to get to the end of this. And it's all about that biomass production between the start of flowering and getting through to the end. And that's what our short season varieties are doing. They're actually utilising that water better to increase that to, towards the end. So in this, um, what we're seeing here, diamond in the short season, adding that nitrogen, um, yeah, getting it above that four tonne, nearly got there on its own. Um, but yeah, anything later than that. So we're talking about uh, a hybrid versus an open pollinated, two different herbicide tolerances there, but obviously producing a lot more biomass, uh, the, hot, the hybrids versus the open pollinateds, and utilising nitrogen better, actually putting on more the ability to put on more biomass than the open pollinated as well. So that was a key key message there. Uh, in a dry season, um, what happened? Um, our short seasons were really struggling to hit that that benchmark, but considering that we're running out of moisture, actually, it, it was much better to be in this situation than than this situation. But once again. Um, the same exact same trend in a dry year where we had uh, the short season um, varieties, the hybrid varieties, adding on a lot more biomass than the open pollinators. Oh, sorry. Yep. Um, when we get to maturity, um, the same thing happens if you take out the seed out of the out of the um, biomass. So if you do a harvest index, we actually don't get a yield benefit anything above uh, um, about an eight tonne uh, maturity biomass. Um, so the, anything above that actually actually will uh, be all in the seed. So um, that little couple of benchmarks there to assess if you're doing assessments in your field. So this was all the summing date data that we had from those, those three years. Um, the key messages here, so 2015 and 2018 were the dry seasons, 16, 17 were the, the, the pretty decent seasons where we averaged about 3.7 tonnes the hectare. Um, in, in this, what we can see is in the dry seasons, the fast to mid-fast varieties are definitely outperforming the mid-slow mid type varieties in a dry season. In a good season, they're still competing exactly the same as our slower developing varieties. So in our, in our experiments, what we've found is for risk management and those types of things, definitely selecting a fast to mid-fast variety is giving us that best risk management option in our environment. In 2017, we um, compared our hybrid versus open pollinated TTs. Um, and what we we're finding is uh, we we're topping out the, the OPTTs at the high rates of nitrogen. Um, but then the hybrid had that more nitrogen use efficiency and was getting a bigger, bigger uh, yield gain at the end of that as well, which related to a uh, more profitable income uh, in implying, applying that rate of nitrogen. So uh, the hybrids are utilising their nitrogen a lot better. In 2018, what we found was we actually still had a yield benefit to a nitrogen response in a decile two year. So being on the back of a cereal stubble, we're still getting a yield benefit. But if you fell out the back of the flowering window, you actually got the negative, a negative response there. So you still had to hit that 
optimal flaring window to get a good nitrogen response. Fall out the back of it, yeah, it actually went the other way. So that was a key, key message that came out of two, 2018. If we combine all this together, trying to look at this over time, if we look at um, high, uh, diamond versus stingray, uh, we're getting about a 30% gain at time of sowing one, and an even bigger gain, or no, no, about, about the same in time of sowing two. Uh, going into a mid-fast variety, we, we're even getting a bigger jump um, than, the, than the fast variety. So I guess that's probably the key message there. Um, we're talking about variety selections and what we're doing and taking opp opportunistic uh, sowing opportunities. So if we were going to go early, these are the type of varieties that I would be selecting. So 45Y91, Ignite, or if you're into Roundup Readies, something like a 45Y25. Um, Mid-April, a Diamond in the clear fields, Banker, 44Y90. 43192 and saintly new one coming through trophy uh, 350 TT 4510 and spark um, and the roundup readies are there as well in high risk situations as Therese was talking about there stingray Benito and diamond definitely good options still so making sure we're, we're weighing up our risk opportunities there but potentially there's a better crop to sow other than canola in that situation in the Wimmera, pretty much the same. A few different varieties uh, coming in then. Um, in late April, there's a new conventional variety there in Quartz, but pretty much the, all the other ones are, are staying relatively the same. So I was doing a bit of the same thing as Therese, so I, I went back through um, the last nine years of sowing opportunities because I was like, oh, well, this means nothing if we can't get the crop up. Right, so actually the only year that we didn't have a 10 mil or above germinating rain to get these, uh, the canola up in the right, opportunity, in the right um, window for choosing which variety we wanted to do was 2018. So this was the Birch at Woodlands um, bomb station and that was 9.6, I think, was that, was that rainfall. But all other, all other um, timings definitely had an opportunity to get varieties up in the right window. Um, so that was probably my take home message there is, yes, we're talking about ch trying to get canola to germinate in earlier than what we probably are expecting but definitely um, we've got opportunities where we're definitely getting opportunities to sow those really fast varieties in May and then we're getting those op uh, probably five out of the last nine or yep five out of the last nine that we've got an opportunity in April as well so 50% of the time we're getting opportunity in April so there, there, there's probably a a good justification for trying to get those varieties in the right windows. Where to put it in the rotation? So I did an analysis on our main sites for the last uh, three years, um, and this is where it this is where it came out. So what we've got here is um, it, it's been on a fallow crop, so I included that in the gross margin. But what we're finding is hybrid canola 525 and barley came out at about 497. So, but when we look at the variation in dollars per hectare, canola was a lot more variable than barley. So that's probably um, something that to where people are, are weighing up there. So that, that's where we, that's where we, and then we see things like lentils have a variation of about $678 per hectare. So that's taking the price at harvest time, that, that analysis is doing. So um, that was the yield versus the price and then the, and the costs were taken out of the, um, the gross margin booklet produced by um, Persa. So summary, target the optimal flowering windows. You utilize the new app, that's a really, really handy tool um, with good germination on time, hybrid varieties will outyield the available OP varieties. 
choose varieties with flexible phenology like 44Y90 or 43Y92 can be a really good risk management strategy. Apply 80 kilos of nitrogen per hectare for a one tonne of yield gain, so that's a good rule of thumb to take home. And when you get out the back of the window, um, yeah, recommend in, uh, the, that re yield reduces from its optimal by about 5 to 8% per week. So they're the, probably the key messages there, and it's an exciting space. We've got some really good varieties coming through with the triple stacking of herbicides now and all those types of things. So when, the, when their yield potential gets up to the other ones, it will be fantastic. So um, yeah, thanks. Questions regarding the project? Yes. Yeah, um, it's it's rocky, Cam. Um, in, in the in your as you've driven earlier planting and driving for higher yield, have you taken into can or looked at what's happened to the oil content? Because you know it's not just about yield, but you know what's happening to the oil contents as well. And did you include oil content in your gross margins? Yes. Yeah, so, so um, definitely in the, so as we're driving uh, yield up, protein is definitely going down, um, but yield is outweighing the bonus that we're getting from the oil content decrease is as a gross margin. That's, that's probably the easiest thing there, yeah. That's what we've been finding regularly. Yield's king. The oil, it, Cargill may not be happy about that. I don't know. <laughs> um, Cam, I've got a quick question. Um, a lot of information on things that I guess for 2019 are water under the bridge. Um, there's a lot of canola around. The crops are really big for what we normally probably deal with in our region. What are the guidelines around uh, making decisions around direct heading and windrowing? And if you are wind growing, what's the guidelines around timing? That's a good question, Kelly, and it can be quite hard to make those decisions if we've got variable paddocks is probably... But um, the, the guidelines, and they're actually in that book, so if you want to grab that book, it's a, it's a really good guide. Um, but so, so we're, we're targeting 70% colour change, um, and what we're doing for wind rowing, and what we're doing is... Uh, taking uh, the pods from all over the plant as well. The, main, the old recommendation was assess the main stem. What we're doing is actually now taking a lot more pods from all over the plant. Uh, the, the research that's been happening up north is actually the drive where the yield's coming from in a canola plant, and a lot of that yield is actually from the secondary branches, and we need to be actually taking that into account when we're making that um, when we're making that assessment. Uh, direct heading versus wind rowing um, argument uh, is one that we, we, we have battled with on our own farm. I could probably uh, talk about that. Um, and a lot about it, and we talk a lot about with Rowan and Brill um, about the structure of the canola and how it can feed into the, to the header fronts when you've got such a bulky crop. So. They're, they're the things that you need to consider when, you, when you're going into that. Um, our tall hybrid varieties sometimes um, can start to fall over and not feed in just as well. So they're the ones that we're targeting to uh, Winrow. Um, our shorter type varieties, that's the ones that we'll probably target to direct head. And our very even paddocks is the ones that we'll target to direct head as well. So ones with elevation will probably, Winrow is the other is the other thing, so as an agronomic thing. Um, the other uh, finding that we've had in other trials is uh, allowing the crop to mature definitely has a um, added yield, uh, yield, slight yield bonus, but also an oil bonus coming into the end of the season. Some of the work that we did with Bayer at the time with the Podguard trait, um, now BASF trait, uh, yeah, definitely having an advantage of um, that direct heading with that pod guard trait, and then you don't have the risk of shattering as well. So that's 
it was a, a really good finding that added yield and oil bonus. Thank you to... Yeah, there's books at the door, please, please take them as you leave. Uh, Kate Finger, would you like to come up for a moment, Kate, as one of our staff members? So I'm going to announce the uh, winners for our seed guessing competition. So thank you to everyone um, who did enter our seed guessing competition. We've now calculated the uh, winners. And so our members prize winner who received one tonne of catapult wheat seed kindly donated by AGT is Martin Warren um, with a guess of 43,007 seeds. And our non-members prize winner, um, who's going to receive a mini Esky and model tractor kindly donated by O'Connors, is Aaron Cutler, um, with a guess of 47,582 seats. Um, if our prize winners are still here, could you guys please come up to the front so we can get a picture? Um, otherwise, uh, for those who might be interested, there was actually 44,993 seats in the jar. <laughs> So thank you. Okay, that, that about wraps up the day. So thank you to all our presenters. Uh, thank you to the sponsors of the BCG. Thank you to all the growers and everyone who've attended and continue to support BCG. Please, please join us for a drink on, uh, as a Furfy Beer Company have, have got some light refreshments for us as we go out. And please... Uh, when the staff ask you to fill out the evaluation sheet, please fill it out. It really helps us going forward. So thank you, everyone, for attending, and uh, it was a great day.